Good morning, everyone. We're just going to give a few more minutes for participants to join. But if you could start by filling out our webinar poll uh, to let us know who you are and where you're from, that would be great. still see a few people joining but we have a packed agenda so i think we will get started uh, right now uh, so welcome everyone i'm betsy mcclure and i'm the stewardship program supervisor for the kettle creek conservation authority and this is our second webinar in the crops and conservation series this series is being delivered through a partnership of the five southwestern ontario conservation authorities Essex Region, Lower Thames Valley, St. Clair Region, Kettle Creek and Catfish Creek. And the webinar series is made possible through funding from the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. This series will explore best practices that will help to improve soil health, uh, water quality and erosion control and reduce nutrient loading to Lake Erie. Today, you will hear from five local farmers that will highlight the equipment modifications they have made for various practices such as strip till, manure application, or cover crop planting, and their successes and challenges. We will, we will begin the session hearing from all of our panelists, trying to keep that portion to about an hour, and then we will open it up to have your questions answered. You will find the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen, and if you'd like to ask any of our panelists a question, please type it in the box and press enter to have it posted. If you would include which panelists you would like to address it, that would help us as well. Feel free to interact with others in the webinar through the chat box. And for any certified crop advisors participating, we will post the QR code so you can receive your CEUs at the end of the session. And as a reminder, this webinar is being recorded and will be emailed to you following the session. Uh, we have a full lineup today, so let's get right into our presentations. Our first speaker is Ken Hardemank, and Ken farms with his wife and four children south of St. Thomas. They have a small farrow to finish hog operation and grow corn, soybeans and wheat, and also do some custom manure application. They have also recently switched over to a strip till system. Welcome, Ken. Good 
You're on mute there, Ken. Sorry, good morning, everyone. I'm gonna be talking a little bit about what we've been doing on our farm, uh, some of the modifications we've done past couple of years. As Betsy said, we are new to the strip tilling world, so we are still, we still have a lot to learn. A little bit about our history. Our previous system, we were doing full width tillage that consisted of a fall mold board, fall mold, mold board plow pass, and then two to three passes in the spring with the cultivator. Uh, this system did work well for us. We had good results, but we wanted to move to a system that would better protect our soil. So some goals that we had were to, first of all, improve soil health. We want to leave our soil in the field by protecting it with either crop residue or cover crops. We also wanted to improve our soil structure so that we could protect it against compaction and improve water infiltration and increase organic matter. We also saw that there was opportunity to better incorporate our nutrients so that they would be more available for crops. And we wanted to do this and at the same time maintain similar yields as our conventional system. So I had been interested in the strip till system already, but was not sure how to make it work with liquid manure and it also required some significant investment. But in September of 2018, I attended the strip till demos at the outdoor farm show and was impressed by the Coon Gladiator created nice strips. The adjustments on the machine were simple, no tools required in the field. And it looked like it could be easily mod modified to incorporate liquid manure. So the following spring, we did make the commitment and purchased that strip tiller. We had an existing manure tanker and also a GPS and flow meter. Our GPS system, we upgraded to RTK accuracy for strip tilling. Some modifications that we did, uh, the strip till toolbar, because we wanted to be able to run it behind either the tractor or the tanker, we did not want to modify the hitch on that. So we worked with Noon Industries to fabricate a custom hitch with a standard category three quick hitch on it. On the strip tiller, we mounted a six head manure distributor along with hoses and drop tubes behind the shanks. Drop tubes are fabricated out of three inch tubes. They connect between existing dry fertilizer shields. So they are quite easy to remove. And that is the finished project with the strip tiller mounted behind the manure tank. Operation of the unit. There's a gate valve on the front of the tanker which controls flow of manure. And as it exits, there's the flow meter measures the flow of manure, sending the re reading to the GPS. The GPS calculates the applied rate based on the travel speed, flow, and application width. The rate can be adjusted by opening or closing that gate valve or by changing travel speed. And I can apply between three and 8,000 gallons of manure with little to no manure boiling out of the strip. Uh, because we are a livestock operation, we also have manure to deal with. Uh, manure is a waste product from livestock production, but for crop production, it is a valuable resource because it is a good source of NP and K as well as micronutrients and organic matter. Table on the left here, we have some average nutrients found in liquid hog or liquid dairy manure. On the table on the right has some typical nutrient removal rates from different crops. You can see how the nutrients found in manure can nicely complement the nutrients removed by different crops. Our strip tiller we run in the spring and in the fall. So we do all of our fall passes with a shank unit. We also tighten up the chains on the conditioner reels so that we can leave a higher berm with more of a textured surface. And in the spring, we remove the chains and I fabricated some brown bar to insert in there to level the strips and to break up any clumps. We also fabricated a spring freshener that goes in place of the shank. It uh, does value or shallow vertical tillage to warm and aerate the strips in the spring. Planter, we plan to put on some STP blades on the opening system and our closing system 
currently have one curved tine, one smooth and a drag rake behind, which seems to work well for closing the seed trench. STP blades are basically a serrated blade that as it rotates, it lifts and fractures the sidewall, making it easier to close the seed trench. Strip tilling into corn residue. Uh, some challenges, challenges that we faced were, uh, were having plugging, um, especially when corn stalks were damp or when we'd get too close to the old corn row. Uh, solutions that we found were, were to increase the down pressure on the row cleaners and to chop corn stalks. I mounted a camera on the back of the unit so that I could better monitor for plugging issues. We were fortunate this past fall that our custom combine operator purchased a chopping corn head and we found that there was much better material flow through the strip tiller. It also seemed to leave cleaner, darker strips. On the left, there's some strips that are prepared for corn. There's about 3,000 gallons an acre of hog manure in those strips. And on the right, we have some strips that are prepared for twin row soybeans. Past couple of years, we have been running strip till and twin row soybeans together and have had good results with that. Soybeans seem to like a little bit of extra tillage before planting just to warm and make a better seed bed. This is uh, strip tilling into cover crops. So after wheat harvest, we planted some twin row cover crops. And then we followed that by about 4,500 gallons an acre of a broadcast application of manure and then about a month later, we came in again with another 4,500 gallons an acre through the strip tiller. You can see that same cover crop in October. The regrowth was good on it, uh, good ground cover, and there's not going to be a whole lot of soil leaving that field. As I said, there's good growth on it. Uh, see some of the tillage radishes were getting to be quite large. It was uh, interesting to see that. And as I spoke about earlier, we want to be able to run the machine behind either the tractor or the tanker. So in less than five minutes, I can have it changed from the tanker to the tractor. Not a hard job. Here's some twin row wheat cover crop that we went into. Uh, this is a new experience. I'd always planted into dark soil. So running into a green crop was definitely a new experience. This is the same field at emergence and then later stages of crop development. By the time the corn was waist high, there was little wheat showing anymore. Challenges that we ran into this past year. Uh, I was getting to be later than we liked to plant, so we maybe rushed a little bit. Um, soils were cold and of course we had a cold rain afterwards, so emergence issues were quite common, it was not pretty to look at, but there was good root development. Saw a lot of tillering in the, in the corn, showing that there was fertility there. We also have a central inflation system on our tanker. Uh, some components of that, we have a compressor that is mounted on the tongue of the tank. It's powered by a hydro hydraulic motor. And then there is a supply tank mounted to the side as well. There is an air delivery system which delivers air from the supply tank to the tires. The tires have, or the rims have a large hole cut through them to allow for quick inflation and deflation of the tires. There's a control box that is mounted on the front of the tanker and also a controller in the cab. Uh, the controller in the cab is where you preset your tire pressures and you can toggle between three preset tire pressures. Um, it also shows the functions of the unit. Benefits of this system is that we are able to decrease our air pressure in the field, meaning that we have a longer tire footprint, that weight is spread out over larger area, reducing compaction. And it is also easier to pull, so lower fuel consumption. The time for tires to deflate is quite quick. Uh, 10 to 20 seconds. And we're able to increase air pressure for road travel, which also means reduced fuel consumption and it greatly extends the tire life. The storage tank and compressor have 
enough capacity to inflate tires in three to five minutes. And that is all that I have for my presentation. That's great. Thanks, Ken. Uh, we're going to keep rolling. So we have time for questions at the end. Uh, next up, we have Mike Bellin. Bellin Farms is a generational farm family that operates to preserve and improve their soils with the use of no-till, cover crops, and crop rotation as a priority. They produce high quality commodities while maintaining soil fertility and increasing soil organic matter of each acre. Mike's farm is located near Oil Springs in Lambton County with mostly Brookston clay loam soil. They produce corn, soybeans, and soft red winter wheat using 100% no-till since 1991 and incorporating cover crops since 2014. Welcome, Mike. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Betsy and uh, the Kettle Creek Conservation Area uh, for allowing me to speak here. Um, yeah, let me uh, share my screen here. So like Betsy said, um, we've been no-till uh, since 1991 um, when um, my dad started no-till. Um, at that time, that was uh, due to other uh, circumstances other than soil health that he started no-till um, and it's uh, greatly benefited us since then. Um, we got into uh, cover crops um, in 2014 and uh, we started small. So uh, we've, we've expanded that quite a bit. We started small and simple, but uh, each year we get a little bit more brave and uh, <laughs> trying new and different things. Uh, we've interceded into corn um, since 2017 that we've, we've uh, come up with our own rig and that's kind of what I'm gonna uh, show you here today. So like uh, Betsy said, I, we're farming here in Lambton County um, and our closest um, watershed type is the Sydenham River. And that's, uh, that's one of our concerns, I guess. So it, uh, it comes down to um, the why, right? Why, why, um, why did we build our, our strip till machine, our cover crop applicator and interseeder, I guess. Um, we want to, it all comes back to soil health and having a healthy soil and, and capturing the nutrients that uh, the, the, uh, the cash crop um, doesn't utilize or hasn't utilized yet and keeping it from uh, entering any ditch or stream. So, um, we're trying to have a, a living cover crop or a roots growing at all times. So um, one of that, one of those aspects was interceding into standing corn because we wanted uh, a cover crop growing um, essentially and taking over for when the corn is done, um, done is growing and used up the nutrients. Uh, so some of the the equipment that we we operation, um, like Betsy said, uh, corn, soybeans, and wheat, we keep to that rotation. So our our nutrient management is uh, essentially synthetic fertilizers that we uh, that we that we apply in season. Um, we have a, an operation um, uh, scalable with our equipment um, that we are able to essentially spoon feed um, the, the nutrients or nitrogen for the corn and, and uh, wheat as well. Um, so we designed our uh, cover cropper, we call it. Um, essentially, it was a, um, a row crop cultivator that we converted um, and it will split apply our nitrogen application as well as uh, interseed 
um, cover crop into the standing corn. So we've had uh, we've had a couple variations of it, uh, one, two, and we're kind of working on three, um, kind of keeping it to a basic design. Um, essentially, uh, the the uh, design number one was the cover crop goes into these uh, reused insect uh, insecticide boxes um, and distrib and and ground driven. This uh, inner the cover crop seed drops onto the deflector and into in front of the the working coulters here on the uh, so the corn is going through down this row here and this is the bare row 30 inches um so the the intent of um the discs here was to give a little bit of seed to soil contact um on the uh the cover crop seed um so we do, we've been doing a split application. Um, we, we put a little bit on with the planter. We'll go in at the, uh, at a very early stage of, um, of corn development and we'll put another application of nitrogen on. And that's where we will add the cover crop so it can get a good start. And then we will go back as late as possible and, uh, it, um, top up our nitrogen application um, in the corn um, and hope, and we won't uh, apply any cover crop at that time. So the intent is to uh, essentially mitigate some of uh, some weather risks, um, depending on the spring, um, we can spoon feed our uh, nitrogen to the corn um, as we see fit for the spring. Um, if it looks like it's gonna be wet, and we're not going to be able to get in there that that's going to dictate on what we do and how much we put on at the time um so one of the questions is you know why don't you just put on a, a nitrogen application at the tassel time um one of the reasons is uh we're planting essentially this is what we're planting into is a uh, vetch cover crop after our wheat and so our, our theory there is um, that as the vetch dies and breaks down, um, it, it, it supplies um, a little bit of boost uh, nitrogen later on in the season at the tassel time. So we're kind of um, in a roundabout way applying for timings of nitrogen um, throughout the growing season of the corn, planting at planting. Um, two applications of uh, side dress, and then when the uh, when the vetch and the peas and uh, the cover crop break down later on in the season. So that's kind of our our, our approach that way. Um, so you can see the corn that's been planted into that vetch. Um, it does leave a nice um, nice seed bed, um, and the vetch isn't that hard to plant through, to be honest. Um, so this is our nitrogen in our corn, um, just as an example of uh, of our our rates. Um, so we're not uh, we're not overly heavy on um, on nitrogen um, for our, for our area and our our yield goals. Um, so that's uh, in this uh, calculation here. I don't really have a number for the uh, what the vetch would provide as a nitrogen source, but uh, we know that it does, uh, as it does break down. Uh, version 2.0, we added a different set of wavy coulters um, and some tying harrows at the back because we just weren't getting uh, um, good seed to soil contact. And uh, actually this works well because the faster you go, <laughs> the better <laughs> the better the seed to soil contact. So it, it works well with a, a a 28 nitrogen application in the cover crop. Um, just another uh, another angle of it here. We added these um, spring system here to keep down pressure on the uh, wavy culture here to keep um, because we we're uh, finding in a drier condition um, we were having a little bit tougher time keeping it uh, um, enough down pressure there for. 
Um, yeah, so that's uh, that's kind of all I've got for our our, our um, machinery um, modification as far as nutrient application. But uh, really, it comes back to you know keeping us healthy soil, and uh, you know it's a it's a full circle because that healthy soil helps keep the nutrients um, there for the crop and and not uh, running away after the crop's done and hasn't used all the nitrate nutrients. So that's it, thank you. Thanks, Mike. Um, our next speaker is Adam Buffer. Adam's farm is near St. Thomas where he grows corn, soy and wheat with his wife and two sons. Adam also works for Bayer as a corn and soy agronomic systems manager covering the country focused on germplasm traits crop protection and agronomy. Adam has his CCA ticket, his undergrad and master's of science from the University of Guelph and is engaged with the local soil and crop organization for testing of local projects. Welcome, Adam. Get myself off mute. Thanks, Betsy, and appreciate the opportunity to uh, participate in today's webinar. Um, so when uh, Betsy approached us, um, I guess Margaret twisted my arm to um jump in to participate here today um and for those that follow me on twitter i'm everybody knows i'm a big twitter guy um you can see kind of the progress uh, and some of the thought processes i've gone through on this planter build um i've got a few slides here to just show some of the background homework i've done and some of the thinking or logic i put into this project um i don't have any infield pictures yet um, because uh, this spring will be my first crack at it. But essentially, I started this um, probably two years ago, um, knowing that we needed to move our farm uh, farming operation from uh, basically a full tillage pass, uh, full broadcast um, nutrient application ahead of corn and uh, and get into a, a better nutrient management system and um, our current setup is a, or our previous setup, I guess, was um, fall disc grip, couple passes in the spring with the cultivator and uh, broadcaster P and K, nitrogen uh, P and K, and then just a little bit of starter uh, through the planter, uh, liquid and furrow. Um, you know, with uh, the variable soils as Mac and Ken Nolan, our, our greater Yarmouth Township here, um, you know, not having dry on the planter um, with the additional needs for micros and whatnot, um, I think was really holding us back. And we did uh, run a trial a couple of years ago and I'll get into some more details on that um, and what we saw. But essentially I, I did a bunch of homework, tried to figure out what I wanted um, from a configuration, uh, priced a few new units um, from different manufacturers um really got scared by the sticker shock of buying any new piece of equipment i guess um and then uh and then just going through some thought processes and ended up landing on an, an old style 1770 frame john deere frame i picked this planter up on an online auction in southern illinois back last march um i actually found it through ag talk and, and talked to the owner um, was going to see it on a trip to St. Louis, but wasn't able to, but um, purchased this unit, brought it up in April, and um, we started working on it in the summertime, uh, stripping it down. This is really early stages here in this picture, um, ahead of uh, the frame getting sandblasted and, and painted. And for those that have followed me through Twitter, um, it's, it's coming together pretty good, and we're into the final stretches here. So some of the priorities that I was set out um, in my mind was first and foremost, the uh, variable rate dry starter capabilities on the planter. Um, again, knowing how variable our soils are, especially my home farm, Mac will attest to it. Um, you know, it's, um, it's like riding a roller coaster when you go through, uh, you'll go from a, a heavy clay knoll to a lower, um, you know, low valley that's fairly loamy, and then you'll hit a sand ridge, and then you'll go back into some eroded faces um, and some heavier clay. So, um, again, lots of variability. Um, that tied into the active downforce, um, you know, greater flexibility uh, for minimum no-till situations. Um, 
you know, again, I mentioned our corn was mainly conventional till, um, trying to get away from that as much as I can, especially on our farms that have uh, a lot of topography and the uh, and potential for erosion. Um, again, incorporated a row cleaner system uh, for higher residue planting, um, you know, trying to get into a more dedicated three crop rotation uh, with corn, soybeans and wheat um, and uh, trying to reduce the amount of tillage that uh, that we're doing in the spring or I guess mainly in the fall. Um, and, and just a bit of a story on that one. I tiled my farm that was back in summer of 18 and uh, I had a beautiful cover crop, oats, uh, tillage radish and, and peas or sorry, um, crimson clover. And uh, I made the mistake of taking our disc ripper across those tile runs um, in the fall. And, um, and we had a big spring melt um, on frozen ground the next spring. And, and I had an unbelievable amount, large amount of erosion, um, which really tuned me into the, it's a serious problem, um, especially on my farm. It takes water from the east, um, you know, two to three farms over, and uh, and a lot of it crumbs across um, through the low areas and into the, um, uh, I guess the the start of the one of the tributaries to the Kettle Creek um, here on my farm. So I installed some erosion control structures, um, but again, reducing tillage, incorporating residues or leaving residues on soil surface. Um, trying to get into some more manure applications as well um, was another uh, another uh, push that I want to make. The next one there, uniform weight distribution. I got a couple slides on that. Um, and I also want to maximize our tire footprint. And I see Alex and Ian are both on the call here and Margaret. Um, you know, we ran our compaction day uh, a couple of summers ago in Shedden and uh, certainly opened up my eyes there. And just the last point there, so I have certainly utilized the CAP and LEADS programs uh, to their maximum there. Um, again, the application for dry fertilizer modifications, the active downforce and the row cleaners. I had plans of also incorporating tires into the applications, but um, when LEADS came out this spring, uh, it, back in January, they had capped it to, uh, to a maximum of three per farming operation. So. I've already uh, more than maxed that out, um, upgrading tires on numerous other pieces of equipment over the last few years. So just on the on the compaction front, um, a couple pictures here of different planter configurations we ran uh, during our compaction day. Uh, the top one there is central fill um, seed and uh, an Alari mounted Alari. And you can see this planter was set up with Sosi tracks and really central fill systems. Um, you got a lot of weight over the front and center of that frame and um, certainly the tracks can uh, can help compensate for that as you can see here on the right hand side. Um, this is the pressure that we were seeing. Green is in six inch, red and blue are both in 12 inch um, depth. We did have this um, these seed boxes full of wheat uh, but we didn't fill the Alari so it, it really wasn't the maximum amount of weight there but um, again you can see the footprint there. And then we ran this 24 row um, again with seed hoppers and we filled the Alari uh, with wheat and you can see folded out um, the amount of weight on that center frame tire um, at a six inch depth uh, was, was fairly high. Um, similar uh, weight distribution at the 12 and 20 inch depth. But really, I, I guess from my perspective for the number of acres that we farm, I didn't want to get um, didn't see the need to go to a central fill for corn. Um, certainly we run a, a split row 1223 with the central fill today. Um, that's what we've been running the last number of years. And I have seen uh, issues with pinch row compaction and um, certainly when you get into wet soil conditions, that can be uh, an issue. And this is a, just a bit of data from a colleague of mine in the US um, on their farming operation. They're fairly large growers. Uh, they run a DB90 with central fill. Um, seed and you can see under wet conditions what he did was he took his plot combine and every two rows he took um, you know a length of row and uh, and measured the yield off that and you can really see on your wings you know really no compaction issues here but when you get closer to the center of that planter um, that's really when they saw the biggest uh, hit from a yield standpoint 
And then you can see um, in drier soil conditions, so this is probably just inherent variability across the field. Maybe it's from other uh, tillage passes or, or compaction from other um, times. But again, I thought that was quite an interesting way to, uh, to peel um, some data back. And I know Ben's got a plan this year through soil and crop to try and measure some of this pintro compaction um, by uh, hand harvesting some cobs. Um, but again, some interesting data I got from a colleague there. And really this is what we see. Um, top picture here, you can see the depression in the center of that uh, planter pass. And then the bottom, you can see fairly tabletop uh, uniformity there. So this was really one of the main drivers for me in, in the configuration I went to um, with just the standard dry boxes to try and spread the weight um, across the frame uh, fairly uniform. The next priority for me was getting dry, uh, better fertilizer capacity on the planter. Um, these are some pictures of a trial that I ran back in 2018, sorry, um, uh, where I had a neighbor come in with an old John Deere 7000, you know, the oldest, um, most beat up planter you could imagine, um, and just planted a couple strips uh, behind my shop here. And again, my soil is quite variable, so we had a sand ridge through there. Uh, some lower ground, some higher ground, some heavier clay. And you can see in the summertime, I think this was in August, I went to the droughty sand knoll. And you can see on the left, uh, dry two by two um, versus our uh, liquid broadcast and um, liquid pop up there on the right. So again, drought tolerance, I noticed a big difference there. And then late season plant health. This uh, picture here was later in, uh, later in August, early September. Um, when uh, in this part of the field was some heavier soil uh, that was, um, I would say, no more than fit uh, when we were on there planting. Um, but again, wanted to get away from the full broadcast and incorporation uh, ahead of the planter and get to a two by two. And then this is just some um, summary of that trial work. But essentially, on that sand ridge is where I saw the biggest benefit to, um, to having to dry on the planter of just over 20 bushels an acre. Um, but you can see the full length field strips, um, you know, 11 bushels here and uh, five bushels on my second comparison. So I know, and uh, talking to other growers that have made the switch, there's a good 10 bushels um, there just from having to dry on the planter. And I think certainly our sandier soil um, that we do have here um, in central Elgin um, is another area that, uh, that I wanted to improve on. And then maximizing the footprint. Um, so these old planter frames came with a, a seven and a half by 20 inch bias tire. Um, you can see in the picture on the left there, um, you know, pretty small footprint, but again, this frame is uh, about 20 years old. Um, and you can see its weight capacity and pressure rating there. Um, working with Eric up at Elmira, um, he came down, we measured up how much space we had in those forks. Um, and we were able to fit a VF 255 70R 22 and a half in there. And you can see the load rating, uh, 3,500 pounds at 35 PSI. You know, once I get this planter in the field and weighted up with fertilizer, we'll weigh those wheels. Um, the manufacturer doesn't list, a, <clears throat> excuse me, a pressure rating below 35 pounds, um, but I'm sure we're gonna probably cheat that a bit lower and really try to maximize that footprint. And you can see the picture on the right there, um, a big difference in, uh, in footprints. So, Quite excited to see what these uh, VF tires are going to um, going to deliver, and then again, standard two by two setup um, and the even weight distribution. So row unit hoppers for seed, um, and just a standard dry box um, assembly there. Um, you know, I looked into planters with the center mounted Alari. Certainly, from an efficiency standpoint, you can put a bit more fertilizer in them. Um, but again, I didn't want to have all that weight um, in the center of the planter. And for the number of acres that we plant uh, for corn each year, moving to a 16 row configuration um, shouldn't be too hard to keep up with what I was doing today with the 12 row uh, with the liquid, even with more frequent stops. So again, um, interested to see how this is going to turn out. I'm sure I'll be I'll have to exercise a bit more patience, I guess, having to stop every 25 acres or so to fill with fertilizer instead of loading up for basically a whole field at a go um, and just planting away. So again, uniform weight distribution was a big one for me. And then obviously row cleaners, um, 
I did go down the precision road, um, seeing that they had the, the technology that fit well. Um, and the planter came with a bit of technology on it already. So again, just a simple Yetter Shark tooth set up on a clean sweep cylinder. Um, you can see those uh, clean sweeps in back, behind back there. So again, this should uh, allow me to plant in some heavier residue situations, um, you know, not be afraid to leave the cover crop residue in the field and just plant straight into it from a stale seed bed approach, uh, which is something that I definitely want to try here uh, next spring uh, on a few different fields. So again, it just gives me better flexibility. And then the last last couple of pictures here, again, active downforce. Um, this planter came with, uh, with Air Force. I upgraded the Delta Force. Um, again, uh, looking forward to seeing how this is gonna change on our soil. Um, going from basically sub 1% organic matter sand to um, very hard clay eroded knolls um, and making sure that that seed is placed where it needs to be. I'll, I'll certainly have some pretty dramatic uh, uh, pressure maps to share uh, once we start planting some of these fields. And then my last slide here is just on the variable rate fertilizer section control. So um, again, set up through the precision monitor to uh, deliver um, variable rate starter if I want to, um, being able to put in prescription to, prescriptions into the monitor. And uh, I've got the planter split in half, so uh, eight rows on uh, each uh, hydraulic drive there. I put a picture on the right of the smart firmer uh, from Precision. Um, you know, when these uh, this technology was first launched, it, you know, they had a big thing about um, measuring soil organic matter, cation exchange capacity, and being able to variable rate on the fly. Um, certainly heard good and negative feedback on this, uh, on this technology, um, but I wanted to give it a try on my own soil in our organic matter ranges just to see how, uh, how it's going to behave. So again, I'm not expecting uh, big things there, but again, it's another data layer to um, to go from uh, in building further uh, fertility recommendations in the future. So, so that's a bit of the logic that I put in, some of the thought processes I put into um, to my planter build. And again, haven't ran it in the field. I'm sure Ken and Mac will be eagerly looking at my crop as it emerges and see all the mistakes I made. But, um, but yeah, it's been fun. And um, I'm sure there's gonna be things that I'll wanna change uh, going forward, but I think I'm there from a pretty decent starting spot, so. I will pause there. Thanks, Adam. Uh, next up, we have Mac Ferguson. Mac manages a multi-generational employee-driven cropping enterprise located in St. Thomas, which produces corn, soybeans, wheat, green beans, lima beans, and sweet corn. Starting in 2017, they shifted production practices from broad acre tillage to strip tillage. Welcome, Mac. Good morning, everyone. I, I wanna make it abundantly clear that Adam and Ken both have the opportunity to learn from our mistakes and we make plenty of them. Um, if you could just move to the next slide, please. Two comments. First, <clears throat> it's a systems approach that we're refining annually, adapting the implements to the local conditions. Our background, we were three fall tillage passes. The first was broadcasting P and K. The second was broadcasting a cover crop. And the third was broad acre tillage. Now, all three of those tasks are completed with the soil warrior. Spring tillage was running three field cultivators and sometimes a BRT disc. Now, for the most part, spring tillage is a Vulcan strip freshener. The spring before you start stripping, plant using RTK. I received that advice and ignored it. It was a mistake. The, the next thing that I would like to address, with the unit we have, it takes a lot of horsepower. You have to run two hydraulic operated blower fans. We have a hydraulic operated um, air compressor and the unit holds 10 tons of material and it's a plus it's a heavy unit. 
I think we need a hundred horsepower just to operate the tool for getting about moving the tractor and the ground engaging components. The machine that we have is a three tank unit. It has three hydraulic drives, two distribution systems and implement steer. We have the ability to apply two different products in the strip. The third product may be applied in the strip or between the strips. All three tanks can be operated variably. We found that using the unit in the summer, we had to add a, an oil cooler to the hydraulic system. Uh, could you change slides, please? What we're showing here is our all configuration. We have changed the manufacturer's row cleaners to Shedder to Yetter shark tooths. You can see the white hoses are where the, the cover crop is blown out. If you look at the photograph on the right, it will show uh, scrapers. There are simply a case disc scraper with a custom manufactured plate to mount them on. The operator is happy to use the unit now. In sticky soils in the fall, the containment holders would build up. You couldn't make proper berms. That's been a great um, improvement that we've made. Um, next slide, please. So, here we see the manufacturer's row cleaners, which work great in the spring, fantastic in the spring, and provides you with additional depth control. You can also see at the, uh, where the mount is for the row cleaner, there's an airbag there. There's the individual, or there's uh, row con air control for the row cleaners. As well, we've got a, a weight bracket on there. We put 300 pounds on each wing in the fall so that we can have uniform depth. Um, next slide, please. So what am I doing with a Yetter Stock Devastator? We found that the Yetter Stock Devastator has helped uh, process the stocks in the fall, helps both in the fall and in the spring. The next uh, thing you see is the Gehringhoff corn head. That's a roto disc. In our limited experience, the chopping corn head um, provides us with stocks that are much easier to deal with than a standard corn head. Uh, in addition on that corn head, we have put um, pieces of rubber to deflect the corn stalks and keep the residue over top of the row and away from the row middles where we are making the strips. Residue has been a challenge. Um, next slide, please. So <clears throat> my American friends say, oh, that thing won't work in the snow. The strip freshener works great in the snow. It doesn't like frozen ground. You get in frozen ground and you bend things. Snow works great. Um, the, I guess another thing that we have done to the unit is uh, that's showing a three coulter configuration. The standard lead coulter is a 16 inch. Uh, we carefully measured and have installed a 20 inch coulter and we're finding that we're making a much better berm. As far as berms go in our environment, I want to make the biggest berm we can. Uh, crank those, those containment colders in as far as they'll go, make the tallest berm. They weather down in the, uh, over the course of the winter. My great concern is having flat berms and getting erosion. Uh, since we've owned this machine, we have not had berm erosion. Uh, we had uh, some work done prior to purchasing it. And uh, the machine that was operated was not 
properly configured and we had significant berm erosion. Um, next slide, please. So for us, we have felt that it's important to apply um, fertilizer in furrow and uh, banded to get the crop off to a good start. I know Peter Johnson thinks it's atrocious and, and I'm sure Adam does as well. We grow a lot of second year corn, sometimes even third year corn. And I'm concerned about the residue tying up nitrogen. So we want to have some nitrogen right uh, quickly available to that seedling as it's growing. Next slide, please. So you heard Ken talk about twin row beans. I think he did it first. And I was just envious of how good his beans look. Uh, we converted uh, this 1790 planter a couple of years ago to twin row. Uh, we've used it for green beans, lima beans, uh, cranberry beans, and soybeans. I really like the twin row beans, and I really like planting beans into uncompacted soil. Uh, next slide, please. So you got to have little projects. With our 1990 drill, the men converted it to twin row as well. And we use that to plant soybeans, and I'll show you later twin row cover crop. Both the, the planter has its place, the drill has its place. Um, we have both. I find that with the planter, I prefer, I prefer a planter, I'm a planter guy. In marginal conditions or tougher soil conditions, we use the drill and have been, I've, have been thrilled with the results. Um, next slide, please. So uh, what changes? As a, as a young guy, I, it doesn't matter, I'm not a young guy anymore. Favorite job that I have is side dressing corn with anhydrous. Just love that job. There's just something about it that's appealing to me. Well, when you go to strip till and multiple year corn, or when you have, you're planting green or got a lot of cover crop residue from the year before, anhydrous doesn't work and culture injection of 28 doesn't work. We found that out very quickly and put a wide drop system on the 28 applicator. Uh, next, please. So Adam has alluded to variables, the variable soil types. Uh, Ken hasn't, but I believe on Ken's father's farm, there's a tobacco barn there. One of the things that we have to watch out for is putting too much nitrogen on at any one point in time. A B with the wide drop system, because we're laying the nitrogen on the surface of the soil, I'm concerned about loss. So we've gone to uh, a late application of 28. Typically, that's going to happen when the corn is waist to shoulder high. Uh, next slide, please. So this was a sweet corn field that was harvested. We went in, uh, planted twin row cover crop uh, with oats, rape, crimson clover, and radish. Um, took this photograph this week in preparation. Everything's died off with the exception of the chickweed and you can't see it in the photograph, but there is crimson clover there that's one to two inches tall. I'm really interested in the concept of can we burn that crimson clover back? I, can we stunt it, burn it, use whatever, hurt it, whatever word you want to use, plant uh, a corn crop in there again and see if it will flourish after the corn is up and beyond the critical weed-free stage. Um, so, question that I think a lot of people have is what's the, where do you see the benefit from this? 
For me, the biggest benefit has been on the toughest soils, both on blow sands and what I call 18 hour clays. In both situations, our crops are better. Um, key to our success was getting buy-in from our people, attending SWAC, Innovative Farmers, OMAFRA and Soil and Crop sponsored events was critical to this buy-in. A uh, thank you. Thanks, Mac. Uh, we'll get to our final panelist today, followed by some questions. So our final panelist is Larry Beringer. Uh, Larry has been operating Pumped Environmental Services since 1996. PES graduated from a manure irrigation service company to a drag hose application company in 2000. Uh, besides applying manure, PES builds custom manure spreading equipment such as pumps and pump units and wireless operating systems. Larry grew up in Waterloo County on a family farm. The mixed farming operation included dairy, hogs and some cash cropping. Mechanical experience includes a farm equipment mechanics license and experience on industrial equipment and heavy trucks. Welcome, Larry. Good morning. Could we have the next slide, please? I think before we look ahead to the future, I always like to look back and see what we've done in the past. Here's some pictures of machines. When, when we were uh, irrigating manure, we, uh, we had all customized machines to do that. Um, back in the 90s, this was a very accepted practice. Um, one thing to note is um, when we were irrigating, uh, the spring of 2000 was the last time we irrigated. And we were doing about 25% of our work in the springtime where we were irrigating manure on top of planted cornfield. So then uh, we switched to drag hose and spreading on top of planted crops died off. And now it's kind of come full circle and everybody's uh, talking about it again. And two years ago, when conditions were wet, we actually drag hosed about 800 acres on top of planted corn before the V4 uh, growing stage and, and had good results with it. So it's what's old becomes new again. And so that's, that's why when I'm looking to the future, I always like to look back and, and see what, what we've done. Next slide, please. So we switched to uh, drag hose in the summer of 2000. Uh, one of the reasons we did this using a high trajectory gun was uh, quickly becoming uh, outlawed. The other thing is with a high trajectory gun, you're using high pressure to uh, spray a, a high arc in the field. This uh, atomizes the manure very fine, so it, it creates an odor issue. And the other thing it does is your nitrogen losses uh, skyrocket pretty quick. The one thing about uh, irrigation is we could usually get on soil that uh, might be deemed not suitable conditions for spreading, but suitable enough that we could spread and minimize our footprint compared to other application types. Um, some of the uh, problems we have is uh, also with the irrigation, we were only spreading three to four acres in a setup. So we were using a lot of time moving equipment around the field and, and not spreading. Um, if we come to a roadway and we didn't have access to the uh, other side of the road through a culvert, um, we came up with this solution where we built a, uh, a system that we can lay on top of the road and we can spread manure through it and the uh, traffic can uh, drive over top of it at the same time. So going to uh, a drag hose, we ended up with bigger splash plates, which uh, did a couple things for us. It increased our droplet sizes when we're spreading the manure. So our odor issues changed. Um, the other thing is the drag hose uses a low pressure spreading system compared to the high pressure system of the trajectory gun. And with the low pressure, uh, our efficiency uh, increased dramatically. So we can get a lot more manure in the feet over many more acres a lot quicker than what we could have when we were irrigating. 
the next slide, please. So uh, this shows a typical 50 acre setup. A lot of math and what we do with today's technology, the math has become easier. We can use uh, Google Earth as uh, to help us with some of our setups in the field. The picture on the right, you think you're all alone, you're in a backfield, you can do what you want, nobody sees what you're doing. Well, the, the picture on the right, we pull up a field we were currently spreading in and we noticed something was, was in the field already. And uh, we looked and here, this is a picture that Google Earth took of us uh, two years prior when we were spreading manure in the field. So you're never alone. So you're always trying to do the best job you can and minimize the, uh, the effects of your spreading. So the, the picture on the left shows a, a typical 50 acre setup. Uh, Pythagorean theorem is our, is our friend. Um, we use Google Earth and field measure apps to, uh, to set up our equipment in the field to make sure that we're set up efficiently. So a typical drag hose setup using 1,320 feet of soft hose will give you a, a 50 acre setup if you're in an ideal field. Ideal fields really don't exist, um, but it sounds good in, in theory. So one problem we have when we're, uh, the biggest complaint of the drag hose system we have is why do you put so much manure on the headlands of the fields when you're turning around? Um, the reason for that is we're, we're pulling a hose, a six inch drag hose has uh, one and a half imperial gallons of manure per foot in the hose. So if we're pulling a thousand feet of hose, we've got 15,000 pounds behind us that we're pulling. So when we get to the end of the field, it's like a big slingshot. We've stretched that hose. And when we go to turn, the tension on the hose will not allow us to turn. Over the years, we've tried many different things to uh, uh, eliminate this problem. Uh, we haven't been real success successful until about two years ago where uh, we introduced a little unit called the hose humper, which I'll get into that a little bit later on. Um, a lot of times we're asked why we uh, operate on a, an angle in the field. A uh, couple reasons. The biggest one is um, when we go from corner to corner in the field, that is our longest pull in the field. And then when we turn around, our pulls get progressively shorter till we work ourselves into a, a corner. If we were working straight with the rows in the field, it would be very hard to turn because every turn we make, we're pulling additional hose to make that turn. But even still working on a 45 degree angle, turning is our biggest thing. So with a hose humper, what we can do is we have a second tractor in the field. A hose humper is, is a very simple unit. Next slide, please. See here, we um, hose humpers are commercially available. We built one ourselves um, that fits on the loader of our tractor. So we have a second tractor in the field. And the purpose of this unit is we can push and pull and move our hose around the field with this tractor so that the line behind our spreading tractor is reduced, reducing the stress on that tractor. And therefore, when we reach the end of the field, we can turn around without doing a previous practice was to do a three point turn, which would give us about a 15 second turnaround time at the end of the field. 15 seconds doesn't sound like much, but when the manure is constantly flowing anywhere from 1,500 to 2,000 imperial gallons a minute on some systems, some systems less than that, any seconds you spend in the field turning around is, is over application. And with this little hose humper unit, because we can shorten the uh, length of hose behind the spreading tractor, it allows us to go down the field and do a complete turnaround. So that means that we're applying less manure on the, the headlands, we're not over applying. So the potential for field runoff and leaching in the streams has been greatly reduced. So the, the other thing that we can do with this little unit is a 50 acre setup is normal. What happens if you have 60 acre setup? Well, in the past, we've split that into two 30 acre setups. 
And when you split a field in half to do a setup, you create an imaginary fence line. So now you're turning around one way on the imaginary fence line. And, and when you do the second half of the field, you're turning around an opposite way. So now we've got a swath through the middle of the field that is uh, over applied. So your runoff potential is uh, greatly increased. With the hose humper, we can uh, use it to move our hose. So now we can easily, easily do a 60 acre setup in one shot without creating that imaginary fence line. So our application is a lot more uniform and we've uh, greatly reduced the, the over uh, application. Next slide, please. So here's a, a picture, one on a hay field. Um, with a hose humper, you can either have it in, basically it's a big pulley. So you can have it so that this pulley free wheels so that you can just uh, relay hope. This is all done while we're spreading. This is not while we're shut down. So we can relay hose from one spot to another by having the uh, pulley freewheel, or we can apply a brake and we can hook on the hose and we can drag it down the field to keep that spreading tractor fed with uh, the least amount of hose possible. So as you can see there's two different soil conditions we're working in. And also by keeping our, uh, our lead behind the spreading tractor shortened, it uh, also reduces our carbon footprint because that tractor is not working as hard to pull the hose. Therefore, uh, our uh, compaction is, is greatly reduced as well. Uh, next slide, please. So this is one of the things, we've tried all kinds of things. Some things worked, some things didn't. And we usually like to give names to some of the things we try just to make them a little bit more humorous. This was called our catch and release program. So in theory, when you're pulling a long hose down the field, you have all the stress on the hose. If you could add a little bit of uh, distance to the end of the hose, that would release the stress on the hose. So we had a, a swing pipe on the back of our machine that was hydraulically locked in place. So when we get into our corner and the hose is starting to pull hard, we can release the hydraulics and that would give us about a 17 foot length because our swing pipe was held in an accordion style on the back of the machine and giving us an extra 17 feet of hose took the stress off the hose and allowed us to turn around um, with without doing a three-point turn. The object is to eliminate three-point turns. So, um, okay. And I, I've got all kinds of formulas for uh, calculating what our application rates should be and uh, volumes in manure tanks with today's technology. With today's technology, um, some of that stuff can all be done on your smartphone, um, but there are formulas for uh, figuring that all out. The other advantage of a drag hose is we talk about carbon footprint and usually we're talking about in the field, but a drag hose also reduces your carbon footprint between the manure pit and the field you're spreading in. We do a lot of jobs where we're a mile and a half to two miles away from the storage tank. And a lot of times we have to run through a neighboring farm to access the field we're actually spreading on. We go through once, we lay our hose down, we uh, pump the manure through the hose, and uh, get our job done and then we pick it up again as compared to having equipment driving up and down the road, uh, hauling tanker loads of manure past somebody's place. So we really have uh, very little interference uh, on the neighbors while we're working. Okay, I think that's about all I have to say for today. Thanks very much, Larry. So that uh, ends our panel uh, session. Um, for those of you that have to leave, uh, make, make sure you tune in uh, for the next sessions in the series every Tuesday in March at 11 a.m. Uh, to learn more about cover crops, economics of agricultural BMPs, and a new session that was just recently added, climate change impacts and solutions in agriculture. Uh, and all those will be available through the same Zoom link as today. 
Uh, and also please complete the poll that you will see on your screen uh, just to give us some feedback on the session. Um, a reminder that the webinar has been recorded and will be sent to you by uh, email. So at this time, we'll ask our panelists uh, to answer the questions that we received. If you have anything else you'd like to ask, um, feel free to add that to the Q&A box right now. Um, so our first question, um, Mac. In your second or third year corn, are your strips staying in the exact same location? Um, for example, are you dealing with the previous corn crop root balls successfully? Fantastic question. We had a poor crop of corn this year on, in a specific location because uh, we planted into a huge cover crop, didn't manage it properly. I thought, great opportunity, let's try and keep the strip in the same spot. That's a one and done thing. The corn stalks are too difficult for the equipment that we have to keep the strip in the same spot with corn. You can do it with soybeans and you can do it with uh, twin row soybeans very successfully, but not with corn. Uh, next question is for Adam. Uh, row crop versus big wide tires on a planter tractor with low PSI, which do you favor? Yeah, that's a good question, Ian. Um, I guess I'm set up with 520 duals on the rear of my 7230R. I switched the fronts to VF tires last spring for a bit tighter turning radius. Um, I really like my 520s. I, it gets a little dicey when you go to side dress, but um, having that bigger footprint um, and not tramping the row, I think helps. The super singles, I guess I'm, I haven't, I don't have any of my own experience with it, but I'd probably lean towards still having um, duels instead of a wide super single. Okay. I'm running my 520s around 10 or 12 PSI. They're just, standard agar bibs, but my next uh, tires when those are wore out will be VF and try to get them even lower. Uh, this is a question for all of the panelists. If you were beginning your equipment modifications again, would you do anything differently? Anyone want to start? Ask me again in June. <laughs> Margaret, we're continuously learning. I think the day we, we stop uh, learning is the day we should quit and go to something else. Yeah, I agree with Larry. We're all, it's, it's always going to be a, a new version or a new, new update um, to make it that much better. It's uh, the the problem probably is doing it to scale you know when you when you want to try try something out on uh, 12 16 or 24 row that's pretty pricey um so you almost need a, a model or a scaled down uh test plot uh version first maybe one or two rows but not practical either so yeah it's uh, that's a tough one yeah um, we're still quite new to this practice so at this point I don't know what I would do differently yet but yeah I'd give another year or two the other thing I've done is I've used social media to do a lot of my research we all like to think we're doing something new and different from somebody else but social media is so vast that you should be able to find somebody else who's thinking along the same wavelength as, as you and it's a lot cheaper to use it, your research than to start from square one and, and duplicate what they've already done. Yeah, I would definitely back that one up, Larry. It's, um, you know, as much as we complain about the negativity on Twitter and other platforms, it's throw a question out and you'll get 15 different answers and it gives you different perspectives, right? And yeah, people have already gone down the road and they'll give you a piece of their mind as to why it didn't work or hopefully why it did work or what they do different. 
Um, another question, thoughts on needs for spring refreshes with strip till, all acres, some acres, years, fields, any test strips with or without spring refresh? Oh, sure. Thank you. Uh, ben, it's most important on our silty loam soils. They just seal up and will not dry, uh, firstly. Secondly, uh, wind and water will move residue. And where that residue is moved, we've got to get it off the strip to make it plantable. Um, after that, it's situational. Are you trying to aerate the soil so it'll dry enough to get it seeded? Um, it's a component of what we do. I would say for us coming out of a full wet tillage system, I still feel a little more comfortable doing some tillage in the spring just to uh, warm up the dirt and level it out and smoother ride for the planter. Have either of you guys tried to stale seed bed in the spring with any success? Yeah, I have, yeah, we, we do a mix of everything, Adam. Yeah. Depends on the soil. It, it's all about the soil and the fitness of the soil. I have not. Yeah, that's something I want to try on a few acres. And I think having proper drainage first and foremost is the first thing to correct to, to do that. Uh, question for Larry. Uh, remembering the successful demo of drag hosing um, over a four, six leaf corn at the Farm Smart Expo at Alora a couple years back and recognizing the cost issue currently, is the Cadman CMA system tech something that will significantly enhance in and out of crop liquid manure application where the hose you pulled out is reeled back in, in the exact same path, i.e. would this improve your workflow of application? Okay, when, when we, I, I'm a little bit familiar with Cadman's uh, uh, program. I realize they've changed it lately to reduce the electronics, which has uh, cut the uh, retail price quite drastically to make it a little bit more uh, affordable. Uh, we actually drag the hose in the same 45 degree angle spread pattern that we did uh, before uh, planting. And as long as we did it before um, what they call the V4 stage, no, that's not four leaves. That's when the leaf is formed, it makes a collar on the plant. So V4 is four collars, which can be up to four, five, six leaves, depending upon how fast the corn is growing. And the, uh, the corn would bend over and would come back up again. And uh, damage from our uh, tire tracks was uh, very minimal. Um, the guys that we did it for, uh, surveying them a year later, they said it was a, uh, a great idea. It was a great backup plan because the year we did it, if you had a choice, you could either spread manure or you could plant your corn. You didn't have a big enough window in between rains to do both. So they said it's a great fallback plan. Um, the Cadman system is designed to be used um, longer in the growing season than what we were doing. Um, Problem is planting on, on planted crops. You're so dependent on the weather and conditions might be perfect to do that. And then we get a rain and you might lose a week and a week down the road, you've missed that window of opportunity. So that's, I don't want to condemn the uh, admin system. Um, I just have trouble identifying the economics that, that they uh, advertise. Okay, I think uh, our last question uh, for today is um, whether any of you that have implemented uh, tillage, different tillage practices or cover crops or anything uh, like that, have you, did you take any before and after photos or um, I guess, have you seen differences that are showing a reduction in erosion on your farms? I, I'll start here. Uh, I didn't take any photos, but I, know just from driving around the countryside this winter that uh, a lot of conventional fields there was a lot of brown snow in the ditches and and then in fields that had either cover crop or more residue 
you could see a noticeable difference in the less brown snow lying around. I, I would I I would agree with Ken. I you hate to uh, look across the fence line at the neighbors, but it's pretty visible. It's really interesting with the wheat fields, where you've got your strip. Um, we use clover and and whatever, so we've got something green there when we strip. There's you just don't see erosion there. And as I said, if you build a big tall berm, the berm sheds the water and the water infiltrates um, into that undisturbed soil. Great. Well, I just want to uh, thank everyone again for taking the time to learn with us today. And thanks to the panelists for their time as well. Uh, as I mentioned, make sure you tune in for the next sessions in the series uh, every Tuesday in March uh, through the same link as today. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.